So as I mentioned before, blood pressure is regulated by three major factors. Cardiac output, peripheral resistance, and blood volume. These three factors together play into what we know as blood pressure. Cardiac output is a topic that we've extensively talked about up until this point. Cardiac output, for those of you that don't remember, is calculated by taking the stroke volume and multiplying it by the heart rate. We've even gone into some of the factors that regulate stroke volume and heart rate specifically, so this should be a topic that's fairly familiar to us by now. But peripheral resistance and the blood volume are two concepts that we have not talked so much about thus far. Blood volume refers to specifically what the total amount of blood we have in our body is. Normally, this is between 5 and 6 liters. We will come to see that blood volume is primarily going to be regulated by our kidneys, and that is going to play into long-term control of blood pressure. Peripheral resistance is the other factor that we haven't really spoken much about so far. Resistance is regulated by several factors of its own, but can be described as the friction between the blood and the vessel walls. The more friction that our blood experiences in our blood vessels, the slower our blood flow will be. So it is these three factors, cardiac output, total peripheral resistance, and blood volume, that directly play into and regulate what our blood pressure is. So we're going to take this information and we'll first talk about some short-term control mechanisms of blood pressure and then we're going to go into some long-term control mechanisms of blood pressure. The long-term control mechanisms will relate much to the kidneys as our renal control is long-term. The short-term control of our blood pressure is primarily regulated by our nervous system and our endocrine system. So we're about to get started on short-term blood pressure control, but we first must understand what peripheral resistance is and what factors play into it. And those are the three factors that are listed on this slide. You can see another definition of resistance is given here. Resistance can be described as the opposition that blood flow receives inside of the vessels. And the three factors that determine our peripheral resistance is our blood's viscosity, the total length of our blood vessel and cardiovascular tree, and the diameter of our blood vessels as well. Something to keep in mind, the greater resistance to flow we have, the lower the flow will be. And the less resistance to flow we have, the greater the flow will be. So the quantities of these three factors will directly relate to how much resistance to flow our vasculature is experiencing. We'll go ahead and get started with blood's viscosity. Viscosity of a fluid refers to how thick that fluid is. Something like water has a very low viscosity because it's very, very thin. It flows very, very easily. But maple syrup is a different example. Maple syrup is a much more viscous fluid, and therefore it has a higher viscosity than water will have. Blood is also a very viscous fluid due to the formed elements and large plasma proteins that we find floating around in that solution. We want to keep in mind that the greater our viscosity, the slower the flow of blood. This is going to increase our resistance the more viscous our blood is. So blood is considered a colloid. It has lots of large substances in it that can eventually settle out. Those large substances include the red blood cells. The red blood cells inside of our blood make blood itself a very thick fluid. Our blood's viscosity is relatively constant, however can change due to certain conditions that affect our red blood cells. We measure our blood's viscosity based on the ratio of red blood cells to our blood plasma, and to some degree the plasma proteins in our blood as well. But mostly we're going to look at our red blood cells since those are the very large formed elements and they're going to have the biggest effect on viscosity. So we specifically look at the ratio of red blood cells to plasma. We look at the percent red blood cells in our blood. We know from a few chapters ago that this refers to our hematocrit. Conditions such as polycythemia and anemia will both affect the viscosity of blood. Polycythemia produces more red blood cells. Therefore, a patient that has polycythemia will have a greater blood viscosity than a patient with anemia. Anemia refers to very few red blood cells. We have less than normal numbers of red blood cells, so that would make our blood less viscous. The greater our blood's viscosity will get, the more resistance we have to blood flow, and therefore the higher the pressure. 
The second factor that plays into our total peripheral resistance is the length of our vessels. Now this is typically also considered a very constant value. This does not change drastically day by day. However, what we need to understand is that the greater the vessel length, the more resistance there will be. And the more resistance, the greater the pressure. One instance where there is the elongation of blood vessels is obesity. I know I have said this statistic before, but one pound of fat adds miles of vasculature to our circulation. Specifically, you can see that one pound of fat will add just under 200 miles of blood vessels that our heart will have to pump blood through. So with obesity, when there's an excessive amount of body fat, that's going to drastically increase the total length of our circulatory system and therefore drastically increase the resistance, which will in turn increase blood pressure. As I mentioned, this is also considered one of our more constant factors. However, keep in mind that this will, of course, change if you gain or lose weight. But it is the vessel diameter that's going to change much more frequently. The diameter of our vessels is regulated specifically by vasoconstriction and vasodilation. And this can happen almost immediately. To really hit home the difference between vasoconstriction and vasodilation, we can see this little picture that I've drawn here at the bottom left. This here is a vasodilated vessel. There's a lot larger lumen than this vessel. Basically, with vasodilation, the circularly arranged smooth muscles around our vessels are in the relaxed state. With vasoconstriction, those circularly arranged smooth muscles will contract and that will close in on the diameter of the lumen. So vasoconstriction is a major player that will directly relate to our overall total peripheral resistance. It is these three factors that will control what our resistance is. The resistance will go up if our blood viscosity goes up, if our vessel length goes up, and our vessel diameter goes down. We could also say this last one a different way. We could say that vasoconstriction will go up and that will increase our resistance also. But we have to remember that increased vasoconstriction means there is a decrease in our vessel diameter. So I cannot stress enough the factors that will be regulating blood pressure, cardiac output, vascular resistance, and blood volume. We know that cardiac output is calculated by stroke volume times heart rate, and we've talked about a lot of the factors that will directly play in to cardiac output specifically. Now we can see that resistance will also play a big role in blood pressure too, and that is going to be regulated by our blood's viscosity, our total vessel length, and the diameter of our vessels, also referred to as vasoconstriction. So with our newfound knowledge of what resistance is and what regulates it, we're going to now turn our focus onto some of the more short-term blood pressure control mechanisms. Specifically, we're looking here at our neural control of resistance. We know resistance is directly going to play a role into what our mean arterial pressure is. It does this primarily by regulating our vessel diameter. Vasoconstriction and vasodilation will control how much blood is able to go to different parts of the body. Specifically, if there's a greater demand for oxygen by one part of the body, that's going to lead to a vasodilation to bring more blood to that particular organ. But what is it truly that the nervous system is using to help regulate our blood pressure so quickly? Well, these, the vasomotor center, the baroreceptors, the chemoreceptors, and our higher brain centers are all of the factors that will do this. So we're first going to discuss the vasomotor center. The vasomotor center is located in the medulla oblongata. Specifically, it's a cluster of sympathetic neurons that work well with other parts of the medulla as well. They're going to project their axons down and will eventually help regulate blood vessels through sympathetic nerve fibers. It is this vasomotor center that will play a big role in determining what the diameter of our blood vessels is. We know that the sympathetic nervous system will constrict our blood vessels because that leads to an increase in blood pressure, which is our sympathetic response. Naturally, when we do this, we must decrease our parasympathetic innervation also. We can't have one without the other. If sympathetic tone goes up, parasympathetic tone goes down. So the vasomotor center is the first player that will directly help control our vascular resistance. Our second major factor that's going to control blood pressure are the baroreceptors. Baroreceptors are a very special type of interoceptor that will be monitoring our blood pressure based on the pressure that's felt in our vessels. 
Baroreceptors specifically are mechanoreceptors. They sense mechanical stimuli, which is physical deformation, touch, stretch, and pressure. So these baroreceptors are pressure sensitive. They're going to constantly be sensing the pressure inside of our vessels. We now know that our vessels are constantly increasing and decreasing their pressure through the systolic and diastolic blood pressures that are produced by the heart pumping blood into our vasculature. And these baroreceptors are sensing this. As the pressure increases inside of our blood vessels, the walls of our blood vessels are going to stretch outwards. And that stretch is what is sensed by the baroreceptors. Now the baroreceptors are sort of inhibitory receptors. They're going to be sending inhibitory signals up to the vasomotor center. As our baroreceptors are inhibiting the vasomotor center, they're actually going to lead to a vasodilation of our blood vessels, and that helps to decrease blood pressure. So essentially, what we want to envision with baroreceptors is as the pressure continues to increase, the stretch on the walls of our vessels is greater. And the greater the stretch is on the baroreceptors, the faster they will send those inhibitory signals to the vasomotor center to vasodilate. On the other hand, when blood pressure decreases, baroreceptors will be stretched less. And in that instance, they will send nerve impulses much slower to our cardiovascular center. So naturally, when our blood pressure is lower, baroreceptors will be sending less inhibitory signals, and therefore they're not telling us to drastically decrease our blood pressure below our homeostatic ranges. So essentially, when there's an increase in blood pressure, our baroreceptors will send inhibitory impulses at a much faster rate to the vasomotor center. Now we've already spoken about how that will lead to a vasodilation, but our cardiovascular center will also send responses to increase parasympathetic stimulation and also decrease our sympathetic stimulation too. As a result, this will decrease our heart rate and force of contraction, which will also in turn reduce cardiac output. So it is because the baroreceptors have such close ties to our vasomotor center that we see that they play an integral role in short-term blood pressure regulation. So chemoreceptors are the next major player that's going to help regulate our short-term blood pressure controls. Chemoreceptors might seem a little less intuitive than baroreceptors. You might be wondering how on earth a chemical receptor is going to regulate blood pressure. But we have to keep in mind what chemicals are found in the blood and how those chemicals will play into our overall cardiovascular health. We know that the cardiovascular system's major goal is to get oxygen and take it out to our tissues. So these chemoreceptors are sensing oxygen and carbon dioxide levels in the bloodstream. Just as we saw in chapter 19, hypoxia is going to stimulate more red blood cell production. And here, low oxygen levels, or hypoxia, will also lead to an increase in cardiac output and vasoconstriction. Hypoxia refers specifically to decreased oxygen levels, but we also have hypercapnia, which refers to increased carbon dioxide levels, and acidosis, which refers to an increased amount of hydrogen ions that are found in the blood. All of these conditions are regulated by these chemoreceptors, and if any of these conditions is present in our blood, that will play a big role in increasing cardiac output and vasoconstriction, which will both lead to an increase in our blood pressure. Now, lastly here, our higher brain centers refer to the hypothalamus. We must remember that the hypothalamus controls our autonomic nervous system. It is the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system that's going to produce lots and lots of bodily changes. Remember, the sympathetic response can also be referred to as our fight or flight response because all sympathetic activity increases body activity. Sympathetic nerves are going to start dumping norepinephrine on the heart and we'll also have a hormonal response from the adrenal medulla releasing norepinephrine and epinephrine as well. So at this point, we've talked extensively about how the autonomic nervous system is also going to aid in regulating blood pressure. Now the last four short-term blood pressure controls we just looked at were all part of the nervous system. They were branches from the nervous system and played into the nervous system. But we also have hormonal short-term blood pressure regulation as well. Certain hormonal stimuli can either increase or decrease 
vasoconstriction and vasodilation, and this will directly play into our factor of resistance. So in fact, what we see on this slide are all hormones that act as vasoconstrictors. Every single one of these is going to lead to an increase in vasoconstriction. And you can see this little picture over here is indicating that the tunica media of this vessel is constricting and that's closing off the lumen and decreasing the vessel's diameter. So first and foremost, the adrenal medulla hormones. Norepinephrine and epinephrine, which are our catecholamines, come from the adrenal medulla when it is stimulated. Catecholamines produce that sympathetic response. So when norepinephrine and epinephrine are released into the bloodstream, that leads to an increase in vasoconstriction, therefore increasing our vascular resistance, and that will play a big role in blood pressure regulation. We also have angiotensin II, which you may remember from chapter 18. Angiotensin II is an extremely important regulator of blood pressure. That is its whole purpose, is to play roles regulating blood pressure. Angiotensin II has several actions that are notable and relate to blood pressure. The first action of angiotensin II is it's going to go to the zona glomerulosa and release aldosterone, which is our mineralocorticoid. Once aldosterone is released, it's going to regulate mineral homeostasis, specifically sodium. Aldosterone leads to more sodium retention. We keep more sodium in the blood, and that's going to increase the osmotic pressure of our bloodstream in general. This, in turn, pulls more water back into the blood by osmosis, and this results in an increase in blood volume, and an increase in blood volume will always lead to an increase in blood pressure because our circulatory system is closed. There is a fixed volume inside of our cardiovascular system, so if we increase the amount of blood in our circulatory system, that will also increase the pressure in the circulatory system. So aldosterone will be one way that we're going to increase blood pressure. The second major action of angiotensin II is to go and vasoconstrict arterioles. So that's another way that we're going to see that angiotensin II is going to increase blood pressure. Now a third action of angiotensin II that was not previously discussed is that angiotensin II in the bloodstream will make its way up to the posterior pituitary to stimulate the release of antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic hormone had two major actions. The first was to prevent diuresis, which was urine formation. Antidiuretic hormone allowed for water retention, which also increases blood volume. But the second action of antidiuretic hormone plays into its second name. You might recall that antidiuretic hormone's second name was known as vasopressin. And it gets this name because one of its actions is to increase vasoconstriction. So we see that angiotensin II plays an extremely important role in regulating blood pressure. Not only by releasing aldosterone and leading to an increase in blood volume, but it's going to go and vasoconstrict on its own. However, it also stimulates the release of ADH, and ADH is going to go and have two actions of its own, one of which being vasoconstriction, but this is also going to help us conserve water. So more blood volume leads to more blood pressure. More vasoconstriction leads to more blood pressure. So all of these chemicals on this slide are referred to as vasoconstrictors because they will all ultimately increase blood pressure by vasoconstriction. We will also see that we have some vasodilators, and these are ones that we're probably not as familiar with, so we'll take some time to go over each of these. ANP, or atrial natriuretic peptide, is a hormone that comes from the atria, and this is a vasodilator. We must keep in mind that when we say a decrease in vasoconstriction, we're just talking about an increase in vasodilation. Since vasoconstriction and vasodilation are the opposite events of one another, the blood vessels can either open or close, and when they open, we are increasing vasodilation and decreasing vasoconstriction. When they close, we increase vasoconstriction and decrease vasodilation. So you can see vasodilation over here as the walls of our vessels are opening up and increasing the lumen diameter of our vessels. Some other chemicals that act as vasodilators are our class of inflammatory chemicals, such as histamine. There's a couple in this group, but histamine is the most common that I'm going to talk about in this class. Histamine is what makes your eyes itchy and your nose run when you experience an allergic reaction. So histamine also acts as a vasodilator. We must understand that inflammatory chemicals open up our blood vessels so more white blood cells can get to a particular area of importance. 
This is what leads to swelling and redness when we have some type of inflammation. Histamine is one of the mediators of our inflammatory response. Alcohol is another chemical that will act as a vasodilator. Alcohol specifically prevents the release of antidiuretic hormone from the posterior pituitary gland. We saw that antidiuretic hormone was a vasoconstrictor. So since alcohol prevents ADH release, it will have the opposite effect. This is why, when under the influence of alcohol, diuresis proceeds more freely, and people that are under the influence will have to urinate much, much more frequently. So alcohol will also act as a vasodilator and decrease vasoconstriction. So the next two slides will hopefully sum up some of these ideas about blood pressure regulation in the short term. So let's go over the steps of this negative feedback loop. So we see that blood pressure is our controlled condition. When something decreases blood pressure, that could be a dehydration, that could be a decrease in blood volume, or any other stimulus that decreases blood pressure, it doesn't matter. As long as there's a decrease in blood pressure, our baroreceptors are going to sense this. Baroreceptors are the pressure-sensitive receptors that are found in our large vessels, and they will send inhibitory signals to slow the heart rate. So the greater the stretch, the faster they send those inhibitory signals. However, that's not what happens here with blood pressure. As blood pressure decreases, there's actually going to be less stretch on the walls of the vessels. And this means that our baroreceptors will not be stimulated as much. Therefore, that will decrease how quickly they send those nerve impulses to these different control centers, the cardiovascular center inside of the medulla oblongata and the adrenal medulla. Now we've seen what the actions of these are. We see over here that the cardiovascular center, in response to less inhibitory signals, will be to increase its sympathetic stimulation and also to decrease parasympathetic stimulation, we must remember those always happen together. Now the adrenal medulla, on the other hand, will be stimulated to release epinephrine and norepinephrine. These are also going to help the sympathetic response. So just let's take a second to remind ourselves that all of these things are happening because there's a decrease in blood pressure. The whole goal of this negative feedback loop is to bring our pressure back to normal. That's negative feedback. So, the new sympathetic stimulation is going to go out to the heart. That's going to dump norepinephrine on the heart and increase its stroke volume and heart rate. Therefore, drastically increasing cardiac output. The same system is going to release epinephrine and norepinephrine to lead to a vasoconstriction of our blood vessels. And both an increase in cardiac output and an increase in vasoconstriction, which ultimately leads to an increase in vascular resistance, will both increase the blood pressure. So once our blood pressure is back to normal, we have reached homeostasis. So this slide is going to go a little bit more in detail about each of the factors that will directly affect blood pressure. I put this slide in here because we have a lot of factors going around and it's very easy to confuse which factors affect what. So I'm going to take this very, very slowly and make sure that we have a good grasp of what each of these factors is going to do to play a role into our blood pressure. So we'll start right here and we'll see that this is referring to an increase in our mean arterial pressure. That is the blood pressure that we have been speaking about. So we must remember that mean arterial pressure is regulated by three factors, cardiac output, vascular resistance, and blood volume. You'll see that cardiac output is shown here and vascular resistance is shown here. We have not spoken quite yet about blood volume as that's gonna be a renal mechanism. We'll talk about that shortly. But for right now, we want to see that both cardiac output and vascular resistance, when increased, will both increase blood pressure. So when cardiac output goes up, that increases mean arterial pressure. When vascular resistance goes up, that's going to increase mean arterial pressure. Now, we just spoke about vascular resistance, so let's go over the right half of this summary slide to make sense of these boxes first, and then we'll move over here to the left side. So, we must remember that vascular resistance is regulated by three characters. One is blood viscosity, two is total vessel length, and three is the diameter of our blood vessels. We remember that increased blood viscosity and increased blood vessel length will both have positive effects on increasing the vascular resistance. So we can now not only see 
how vascular resistance affects mean arterial pressure, and how blood viscosity and vessel length will affect vascular resistance, but we can now start to see how increased blood viscosity and increased blood vessel length will also affect our blood pressure. We don't increase one of these without increasing the resistance, and therefore, if our resistance is going up, the mean arterial pressure is going up. So you can see also the blood vessel radius is another factor that's going to play a big role here in regulating our resistance that regulates our arterial pressure. Just keep in mind that when we increase vasoconstriction, that is the same thing as a decrease in the radius of our blood vessels. So I don't want you to get confused if this was to show up on the exam. We have to remember that a decrease in vessel radius is the same as an increase in vasoconstriction, and that will therefore increase vascular resistance. Now we see blood viscosity, which we talked about is the number of red blood cells. That's going to be something like polycythemia or anemia. Anemia, if I was to have anemia here, I would draw an arrow the other way. Anemia is actually going to decrease blood pressure. But the body size in general, such as obesity, is going to be directly related to our blood vessel length, and that is directly related to our resistance. If body size is related to resistance, it is therefore related to blood pressure. So you can hopefully see how when one of these factors over here changes how it's going to affect the blood pressure. And that will be a concept that I want you to have a good understanding for come the exam. That's why I'm putting in all of these arrows so you can see how certain changes will affect mean arterial pressure. So this is vascular resistance. But we also have cardiac output, and we talked about this in the last chapter. So let's do a little bit of review on cardiac output. We know that cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate. So when either stroke volume or heart rate go up, that will therefore increase the cardiac output. We're now making the connection between heart rate and stroke volume and with blood pressure. So, heart rate is going to be mostly regulated here by our sympathetic nervous system. So, heart rate has several regulators. We spoke about those in the last chapter. One of the major regulators of heart rate is increased sympathetic stimulation. And that means more than just sympathetic neurons. We also have the hormones from the adrenal medulla, epinephrine and norepinephrine. When those are released from the adrenal medulla, that's going to increase both heart rate and stroke volume. And you can see that both lines are indicating this from this particular box. Now, we also must keep in mind that when sympathetic stimulation goes up, parasympathetic stimulation goes down. So we want to keep in mind that this arrow and this arrow are pointing in the opposite directions as every other arrow on this page, just so that we don't get confused. The more venous return we have, the greater the stroke volume, and therefore that will increase blood pressure also. Some of the factors that increase our venous return is the amount of blood volume that we have, both our skeletal and respiratory pumps, and a venoconstriction. We don't see venoconstriction happening all the time, but especially when we need to utilize that blood reservoir that our veins will serve as, we'll start to see venoconstriction playing a role here. So I want you to be able to see here how these different factors will ultimately affect blood pressure. If we go and exercise, that's going to increase the skeletal muscle pump, which will therefore increase venous return and increase stroke volume. If we have an increase in stroke volume, that is going to increase cardiac output, and we know that cardiac output directly affects our blood pressure. So we can walk all the way from the top of the page all the way down to see how these different factors are going to regulate blood pressure. Let's not forget our arrow here for venous return. So this refers to the summary slide of our short-term blood pressure controls. We're now going to switch gears and start talking about long-term blood pressure regulation. And this is primarily going to be from the kidneys. Kidneys are the major controller of our blood volume. Essentially, the kidneys are the gatekeepers of the water in our body. If there's too much water in our blood, which means a too high of a blood volume, or perhaps blood pressure is too high, the kidney will then release more water to decrease blood volume. If the kidneys are releasing more water, that means more urine production, or more diuresis. So not only high blood volume, but also high blood pressure will cause the kidneys to release more water. On the other hand, if our blood pressure is decreased or our blood volume is down, the kidneys will then decide to prevent the loss of water and therefore produce less urine in response. So it is the kidneys that are our primary regulators of blood volume. You can hopefully see by now 
why blood pressure and blood volume are so vastly interrelated. So this is what's referred to as the direct renal mechanism. The kidneys are going to help to regulate blood volume if it's too high or too low by adjusting how much water is released into the urine. So the direct renal mechanism is just one way that the kidneys will play a role in our blood volume. However, there's also an indirect mechanism. And you're going to see here that we've actually already learned this mechanism because this is the endocrine mechanism of angiotensin II. This is the exact same mechanism that we saw in chapter 18. So we'll come back to this slide in just a second, but I want to just make sure that we go over the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system once more to make sure that we have this down. If you did not memorize this for the first test, you definitely want to make sure you have this memorized for the second test. Angiotensin II is such an integral chemical in our bodies, and it's going to keep showing up. So we will hopefully remember that some type of decrease in blood volume will eventually lead to a decrease in the blood pressure. And the juxtaglomerular cells in the kidneys are the ones that are sensing this. When there is a decrease in blood pressure, those juxtaglomerular cells will release the enzyme renin. Now, all the while this is going on, the liver is over here releasing angiotensinogen. Angiotensinogen is always being released by the liver. So as soon as our blood pressure drops, the kidneys are going to start releasing renin, and that's going to facilitate this reaction in the blood to give us angiotensin 1. Renin reacts with angiotensinogen to give us angiotensin 1. So angiotensin 1's concentration in the bloodstream is going to be going up. Naturally, as this concentration goes up, it's going to spread throughout the bloodstream even more, and then it will eventually make its way up to the lungs. ACE, or angiotensin converting enzyme, is released from the lungs, and that will directly catalyze the reaction of the conversion of angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. It is angiotensin 2 here that we want to see for long-term blood pressure regulation. Now we also will remember this played a role in our short-term regulation as well. We see that this goes up here, and it's going to lead to a vasoconstriction of our blood vessels. That decreases diameter and therefore increases peripheral resistance. But our other action of angiotensin II was to go out to the zona glomerulosa and release aldosterone. Aldosterone is going to stimulate sodium reabsorption, and therefore that's going to promote more water reabsorption by osmosis. This is one way that the kidneys will help regulate our blood's volume. So this is the exact same system that we saw in chapter 18. I have not changed one thing about this system. It's exactly the same. So make sure if you didn't learn it the first time and you don't have a good grasp of this system that you make sure you are comfortable with this system for the second exam. So in review and in summary about our indirect renal mechanism, blood pressure is going to drop and that's going to lead to renin release which through a cascade of events gives us angiotensin 2. Now this bullet point right here on this slide is going to be our big takeaway from this slide. These are all of angiotensin II's actions. We know that angiotensin II is going to be a vasoconstrictor and it's also going to lead to the release of aldosterone which helps regulate blood volume. But one thing that we've also learned just recently is that ADH from the posterior pituitary is also going to be released in response to angiotensin II. So the more angiotensin II there is, the more ADH there is, and the more water retention we have. Now one other factor here about angiotensin II that's quite interesting is it makes you thirsty. It stimulates our thirst center in the brain. So naturally when angiotensin II is present you're going to be more thirsty, you're going to be more inclined to drink more water, and that will also help you to increase blood volume. So it is in these actions that we're going to increase blood volume and that therefore will give us an increase in blood pressure. So one more summary slide to tie this all together is that a decrease in blood volume or a decrease in blood pressure, or for that matter both, are going to have many mechanisms to restore blood pressure back to normal. We have our endocrine mechanism, which is facilitated by antidiuretic hormone, angiotensin II, and aldosterone. These are major players that are all going to eventually lead to the increase in blood volume. Increase in blood volume, therefore, will increase blood pressure, and that will restore our homeostasis. But the nervous system also plays a big role here, and that includes our baroreceptors and our chemoreceptors, as well as the cardiovascular center and our autonomic nervous system.
The sympathetic nervous system directly plays a role on both stroke volume and heart rate, therefore increasing cardiac output, and it will also lead to a vasoconstriction, which is going to increase our blood pressure here. The cardiovascular center plays a big role in vasoconstriction as well, so we can see that the increase in blood pressure and increase in cardiac output lead to a restoration of our homeostasis when blood pressure and or blood volume are decreased. So to switch gears a little bit here, I'm going to just briefly mention the definition of autoregulation. Different tissues have different demands, and autoregulation ensures that each type of tissue in each organ gets the oxygen that it needs. Autoregulation can be defined as the ability of a tissue to automatically adjust its own blood flow to match its metabolic demands. Tissues such as the heart and skeletal muscle have increased demands during physical activity. And if it wasn't for autoregulation, we wouldn't have such an efficient ability to go into exercise. So each tissue that has the ability to autoregulate will contain their own vasoconstrictors or vasodilators, which will change the radius of our blood vessels and therefore increase or decrease flow to that organ based on the need for oxygen and nutrients, as well as the removal of wastes from that tissue too. So we're going to switch gears and we're going to start to focus on some of the pathological conditions pertaining to our cardiovascular system. Hypotension and hypertension are two that we're going to focus on first. Hypotension refers to low blood pressure and hypertension refers to high blood pressure. I encourage you to start understanding what each of these words mean and start adding them to your own personal dictionary. So there's two types of hypotension we're going to mention orthostatic hypotension, and chronic hypotension. As the name would suggest, chronic hypotension is something that occurs persistently. Orthostatic hypotension, on the other hand, is a more temporary form of low blood pressure. This is often seen in the elderly, but can occur in all different types of age groups. Since the sympathetic nervous system is not as efficient when we get older, it cannot compensate for postural changes. It is orthostatic hypotension that is the cause of dizziness due to standing up too fast. Naturally, our sympathetic nervous system is able to compensate for this, but in aged individuals, it's much less efficient. So this eventually leads to a decreased blood flow going to the brain, and that's why you end up feeling dizzy. Chronic hypotension, of course, is more long-lasting. This is often due to some type of low blood viscosity. Different types of anemia can lead to chronic hypotension. This is often seen with poor nutrition or hypothyroidism. Hypotension is a very serious condition that we need to keep watch over. However, it is hypertension that seems to get more attention. Hypertension refers to high blood pressure. Now, as I've mentioned before, high blood pressure is not an abnormal thing all the time. It's very natural for us to get high blood pressure in times of exercise, in times of sickness when we're fighting off infections, and also in times of emotional stress when you hear a family member is in the hospital or you're having problems with your significant other. All of these instances can raise blood pressure, and that is a normal phenomenon. What is not normal is when that blood pressure does not come back down. Chronic hypertension is a very, very serious condition and part of the reason that cardiovascular disease is such a serious condition. We actually call this medically the silent killer because this manifests and you don't even know that it's taking place. Hypertension is a progressive disorder as it continually gets worse and worse and worse. The longer that hypertension persists, the greater effects are felt on the heart and your arteries. You can see that hypertension leads to a slew of many different types of conditions that are very, very damaging. Essentially, with hypertension, that's putting extra stress on the heart. Eventually, the heart isn't able to keep up with its metabolic demands, and therefore it fails. This can also lead to atherosclerosis and also problems with the kidneys. If the kidneys get too much pressure in them, that's one reason the kidneys can stop working also. If we think back to when we were reviewing the heart, we have to keep in mind that the left ventricle is pumping against the afterload. And when the left ventricle pumps against that afterload, in order for blood to leave the left ventricle, pressure in the ventricle needs to exceed that of the aorta. Just as with skeletal muscle, if the heart works harder, it's going to hypertrophy, which is an increase in size of the muscle fiber. So as the myocardium gets bigger, you lose the space in the chamber for blood to sit within. 
And eventually, if this gets bad enough, the chambers of the heart get so small that you can't even fit enough blood to adequately perfuse the body. And this will eventually lead to heart failure. The higher the pressure in the vessels, the greater the stretch on the vessels. And we only have so much elastic tissue. The more we utilize that elastic tissue, just like a rubber band, the weaker that elastic tissue is going to be. Our parameters for hypertension are actually shown on this slide. You can see the normal range is 120 over 80. We've got our systolics in this column and our diastolics in this column. We have a classification known as pre-hypertension, stage 1 hypertension, and stage 2 hypertension. These are all graded based on how serious they are. Pre-hypertension is from 120 to 139 systolic pressure and 80 to 89 diastolic pressure. You'll see that there's about a 20 millimeter of mercury jump between each of these different stages for our systolic pressure and just a 10 millimeter of mercury jump for our diastolic pressures. So you can see with stage 1 hypertension, our systolic pressure is between 140 and 159, and our diastolic pressure is 90 to just under 100. Stage 2 hypertension takes us up to 160 with a diastolic pressure of 100. So make sure that you feel comfortable with each of the values of each of these stages of hypertension and make sure that you can calculate the pulse pressure and the mean arterial pressure of an individual in each of these categories. Now hypertension comes in two types. There's primary hypertension and secondary hypertension. Primary hypertension is 90% of all hypertensive cases. Basically, nine-tenths of everybody that has hypertension has primary hypertension. And the sobering reality of primary hypertension is that we do not have an underlying cause that we can treat to lower blood pressure. We've identified quite a few risk factors for primary hypertension. However, there's nothing that we can give to these patients that will cure their hypertension. You can see that just a couple of the risk factors refer to diet, obesity, stress, and smoking. There are some other ones in here, but I really want to focus on these. Diets that are very high in sodium and saturated fats are going to increase blood volume and blood pressure. Saturated fats are naturally harder to break down than unsaturated fats, so these are much harder to burn off. Obesity, as we discussed earlier, increases your overall blood vessel length, which therefore increases blood pressure. Smoking, which by now is more common knowledge, is very, very unhealthy. Just one of the reasons why smoking increases blood pressure is that nicotine is going to stimulate our nicotinic sympathetic receptors. That's going to lead to a vasoconstriction and increase in blood pressure. And I've also already mentioned emotional stress. Now it's not so easy to go tell our patients to manage their stress better. Stress management is something that does need to be learned and does take work. Age is another factor that's not so easily controlled. We can't reverse our age, unfortunately. We don't get to decide upon our heredity. So some of these factors aren't things that we can control as much. However, we can control our diet and we can control our activity levels. So this is part of the reason why you're always told at the doctor's office to eat right and exercise more. Now there's also secondary hypertension, which is the other remaining 10% of the hypertensive population. Secondary hypertension does have some type of underlying cause, and we can treat this. So one example of a secondary hypertensive case would be too much renin secretion. If we're releasing too much renin, that's going to stimulate the production of more angiotensin 1 and ultimately more angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2, which we definitely know by now, increases blood pressure. So if we can block the secretion of renin, that's one thing that we can do to prevent hypertension in these secondary hypertensive patients. Unfortunately, it's not so easy for primary hypertension, but these are all factors that you can take into account when trying to treat primary hypertension. Oftentimes, it is your diet and exercise that are the first two lifestyle changes that are recommended in the case of a, a patient that has primary hypertension. You might be recommended some different stress strategies to manage your levels of stress. Again, this is a lot easier said than done, but different types of stress management skills can be very beneficial to people with primary hypertension. Not starting or quitting smoking is always going to be a beneficial health decision, and exercise will promote the loss of weight and triglycerides. Making sure that we have a healthy, balanced diet is key with hypertension. And limiting how much alcohol we drink is also a big player. 
Now, oftentimes, if you go to the doctor's office and you have primary hypertension, you're going to be prescribed these seven lifestyle changes. However, it's also very common that you might leave with one of these drugs. So I really want you to have a good idea of these five drugs and how they're going to be used to treat hypertension. ACE inhibitors is a drug that I've talked about before. This drug specifically prevents angiotensin converting enzyme from turning angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. If we can block the production of angiotensin 2, we will therefore block angiotensin 2's actions. We'll see that beta blockers is also a class of drugs that will help to decrease our overall blood pressure. Beta blockers specifically focus on the adrenergic beta-1 receptor. Beta-1 is an excitatory receptor, and when we block that beta-1 receptor, we therefore will produce a parasympathetic response. Vasodilators and calcium channel blockers also play a big role in decreasing blood pressure. We've seen how vasodilators will increase the radius of our blood vessels and therefore decrease blood pressure. And we know that calcium plays a big role in the cardiac action potential. So drugs that block calcium are going to be another beneficial class of drugs to treat hypertension. The last class of drugs we have is another class known as diuretics. Diuretics promote diuresis, and diuresis being urine production would help to decrease our blood volume. So I'd like you to have a good idea of these five classes of drugs and some of these recommendations for treating hypertension.